other parts. We have um, Christianity, Islam, uh, Jewish tradition. So uh, it is a very complex culture integrating all these uh, belief systems. And then um, we also have uh, to some extent that uh, the stories and the myths uh, have a great prevalence on our lives. So especially these uh, cases like, you know, the uh, uh, possessions, devils, uh, evil, the spirits. So those things are pervading people without knowing what exactly uh, the, the meaning. So therefore, my uncle developed this uh, uh, topic that is psycho-religiotherapy by uh, eliminating many of these uh, multiple personality disorders through the psychological tools and understanding what are the, the dimensions. So therefore, right. uh, uh, he uh, wrote that book and then uh, it was, I think, uh, uh, in his five decades of uh, service to the wider humanity, uh, uh, more than 50,000 people, I think he has healed. And then I have seen the documentation and maybe later I, I also thought of uh, his place is uh, donated to my, uh, I belong to the uh, Carmelites of Mary Immaculate. Um, uh, that is a religious congregation of the Catholic Church. So we conduct uh, psychological courses uh, there, especially hypnotherapy and other uh, forms. But, but, but here's the thing. Uh, what fascinates us in Sweden, because as you might have heard or sensed, uh, in Sweden, we are not that religious. I mean, we, we are kind of what I call the godless people because we, we have been so secularized so that uh, people rarely go to church unless it's Christmas or something. So here, part of what is a lot of therapy that, that you know that I do is people get what is called burnout. And burnout for a lot of people is existentialistic problem. They, f they don't find meaning in their actions. And since we have no spiritual system to fall back upon that is strong, that means that when something happens in life, like a big change, it could be divorce, it could be marriage, it could be getting children, it could be p children moving from home, it could be death, it could be a, a corporation that goes bankrupt or retiring, all these major changes in life, when there is no, when there is no spiritual system to hang it on or to relate to or no God to ask for help, to be honest, uh, people get very confused. So that's why it is interesting in this case, you know, with that. And I also know that when we went to Kerala, uh, when we were there, we found that it was it was the nuns and the priests that were doing therapy because you don't really have therapists in India that much. But you do have a lot of spiritual people and that's where people go when they divorce, get married, die, get a funeral and, and give birth. So it's natural that that is where they get help. Would you comment on that? Yes. Um, uh, thank you for these beautiful uh, photos and also very uh, uh, powerful question about meaning. I can say that, you know, in Sweden itself, there was a person coming to me and uh, uh, she was in her midlife and she was telling me that she did not find any meaning in her life. So uh, what I uh, then I uh, analyzed and examined her life with uh, her going through the different uh, there was uh, in her younger years, there was uh, an abuse done by mm -hmm. a, a close relative. So I was trying to heal her uh, through bringing uh, that person was already dead. And uh, she was really criticizing uh, him thoroughly, um, verbally uh, abusing him, just uh, a kind of, you know, an outburst. So after that, I could say that, you know, even today I am relating to her and then she told me what a splendid uh, transformation she had. So I think uh, about life, uh, we need to have some uh, grounding some foundations. It can be spiritual, uh, but we need to have some 
uh, meaningful foundations. This is what uh, Victor Franklin would say. Yes, exactly. Yeah. yeah. We also have other, uh, recently I was giving some lectures on um, uh, Yeti Hillasum. I don't know any of you have heard about. Uh, then uh, there is uh, also another uh, French uh, lady, Simon Weil. They were not religious. Uh, what, what, is, but, what did you call it again? Uh, Simone Weil, she is a French, okay. uh, but a great philosopher, intellectual, critical, and uh, Simon de Beauvoir and the others, they were all closely associated. But she became, um, uh, so any of the, these three people. Then there is also, um, uh, yeah, Sister Benedicta, who is also a Catholic saint. But all the three people lived in the uh, time of um, that uh, Second World War. Yeti Hillesum yeah. and Edith Stein, that is uh, Sister Be uh, Saint Benedicta. So they were died in Auschwitz and uh, um, uh, Simon Weil, uh, she was almost uh, siding with the, the people who were suffering. So um, I could find that, you know, the concentration camps were uh, the, the most difficult, cruel uh, place and time, but they were able to give solace, peace and happiness to the others. Right. So, the, the, uh, so you need to have, as Victor Franklin said, that maybe it is a religious or a spiritual, um, but we need to have some um, meaningful foundations. So whether it is psychological or whether it is spiritual, but that meaning uh, is something which uh, gives a grounding and that enables people to continue. So in your culture, I think that uh, maybe uh, the uh, relig religious phase uh, might have been gone or maybe it, it will be coming back again. I am not sure about that. Uh, but um, absolutely, there will be uh, meaning mechanisms that gives a foundation and uh, that enables them to make quantum leaps. So which is uh, what I wanted to tell again that you know my uncle developed uh, psycho-religiotherapy. So I have uh, transformed it into adding uh, something from the science that is quantum psycho-religiotherapy, QPRT. So this is what I uh, utilize in my own, um, uh, this hypnosis, uh, because it enables to um, change the coordinates. And they might be in some stagnated uh, orbits. And from the stagnated orbits, this NLP or hypnosis enables a person to make quantum leaps. So could you explain the quantum leap? Okay. Um, I, I still remember that, you know, I was spending almost a day there too. So what exactly is quantum that, leap? That was Christmas for me and Frederick because, <laughs> yeah, because yeah, Frederick yeah. loves quantum mechanics and I was okay. kind of new to it. And, and, so, and so Frederick goes, oh, so you know a bit about quantum mechanics and you go, yes, I'm a professor. <laughs> 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 so it, it was the best quantum lesson I ever had. And yeah. thanks to that, I'm now very interested. But, <laughs> but it would be lovely to get a, a, your, uh, just give us an idea. Yes. Um, uh, well, quantum mechanics is one of the greatest intellectual contributions um, in the human history. It was not by a single person, uh, but by a series of uh, great intellectuals like initiated by Max Planck, extended by um, uh, Einstein, then uh, again extended by um, uh, Niels Bohr, then there are great other mathematicians like uh, Heisenberg, then Wolfgang Pauli and many uh, uh, others. So uh, um, what is this quantum jump or quantum leap? So that is something very fascinating. We have uh, see uh, uh, the, the first element, hydrogen atom. Hydrogen atom has one proton 
and one proton is the nucleus which is positively charged and there is also an electron and that electron will be revolving around the nucleus that is the the proton so this is the ground state and then um, um, integral multiples of h so that is quantum Qu what is meant by quantum quantum is the smallest divisible element of energy 6.62 into 10 to the power of minus 34 joules per second. So that is exactly the quantitative dimension. So when uh, this electron is absorbing energy in terms of one quantum, two quanta, three quanta, etc., it jumps from the ground state to the first, second, third, or fourth. And these uh, levels are known as excited states. And these excited states may not be always remaining forever. After some time, it will be coming back into its ground state. So when it is releasing, uh, jumping back into the ground state from the excited state, the extra energy they absorbed will be released as light, which can be uh, translated into the scientific uh, terminologies as Balmer, Passion, Fund, Series. They are having different colors. So it is not a dragging. It is not like a snake uh, crawling, but it is like a frog leaping from one position to another. So and I think that... It, it, so is this a release of energy or, or a reaction to energy? Um, it absorbs energy and it will be in the higher states and then uh, it will be coming back into the, the original uh, ground state. So it is absorption as well as emission. But uh, this absorption and emission will transform the person. Uh -huh. So... How, how does the absorption and emission transform the person? Yeah, so that, that is a very critical question. Yes. Um, <laughs> yes, so I think that we are all endowed with uh, different problems. And then uh, in once we are in a, a difficult situation or problematic situation, our thinking and our uh, patterns of life will be... Uh, um, in a very specific uh, uh, dimension or a specific orientation. So we may not be able to think uh, correctly or in a wider way. But once we have a jump into the higher levels, we see uh, the situation in a different perspective. So once from that perspective, if we are coming back, I think that enables the person to understand the situation and uh, to transform uh, their own consciousness. So I take a lot of things uh, from um, uh, Carl Jung, who was saying that, uh, you know, the conscious and the unconscious. So the consciousness and the unconsciousness. So, so these two perspectives of the human brain, as he was saying, uh, in his uh, man and his symbols, you know, by integrating the conscious and the unconscious, we will be able to make uh, these uh, quantum leaps. So do you see, uh, Matthew, do you see the quantum leaps as a metaphor or some, something physical that happens? I would say that this is a metaphor. Yeah. A metaphor in the sense that, you know, uh, well, we are also made up of stardust or, you know, physical oh. material particles. So ultimately digestible to the quarks or, or you know, these physical uh, entities. Uh, but uh, I would say that this is more of a metaphor yeah. rather than uh, exactly in the physical dimensions. Yes. So I have seen this uh, in my own uh, um, uh, experiences. So people could be transformed 
uh, by having uh, this uh, uh, a perspective will change by raising them to this uh, uh, hypnosis uh, situation where they will be able to see in a, a much higher level and then coming back into the their own uh, ordinary uh, situations or states then uh, they can uh, uh, confront and uh, they can adjust and transform their own uh, problems and all uh, those situations so so would, would it be correct to say that uh, when you enter a stage of hypnosis to, to make a transition now people are here and they're fighting to get out of this situation but in a state of hypnosis they can make a quantum leap to another level as if it was solved and see another solution and when they get back they have a different mindset than they had before absolutely so this is what uh, i see that uh, because um, when um, we were all discussing about you know what is hypnosis and then uh, you know we are a facilitators we are not uh, giving them any i mean we have maybe some inputs are given but uh, it is their own consciousness that is transforming them so th this is what uh, my uncle i have seen that he was dictating he was telling that you know i uh, change you which will be resisted as uh, both of you are uh, uh, telling me so we are set aside and then we enables them uh, to jump into the higher orbits and this is what exactly i see uh, that you know um, i will give them either with their problems and all you know what is the next what they want to become and i have seen that uh, sometimes uh, people are into this heightened consciousness 3 4 5 even uh, 10 minutes sometimes i will uh, break them open uh, to bring them back sometimes depending upon the situation of the person i will let them go and then i have seen that you know they will be uh, i can see that their eyes uh, uh, will be rolling that means they are dreaming yeah. so uh, after that when they come back i see a smile on their face initially it was such a difficult situation for them but after coming back you know i see that they are totally changed transformed and that is something very fascinating and for me that is the uh, greatest uh, gift enable them to encounter a situation in their life and to transform themselves to change yeah. themselves this is what uh, you were asking me about the uh, yeah. how i see the transition how we are uh, enabling them to so i would say that you know this is uh, yeah qprt maybe we can all develop together uh, into <laughs> quantum psycho religious therapy so that as a tool in transforming this all reminds of uh, reminds me of some nlp techniques uh, but with uh, your metaphor it's it's different of course but in nlp we have something called uh, dissociation you see yourself from the outside so when you're in the more excited state you can see the problem from the outside uh, and also uh, something we call perception chenal positions in nlp so so it's a very elegant way to using the metaphor of uh, uh, quantum leaps and quantum mechanics to do your work yeah thank but, you but, Fre but, frederick yes but frederick also wouldn't you agree i'm i'm thinking loud with frederick now <laughs> uh, because we discuss a lot and i think what's elegant here also is the fact that just by explaining this metaphor because what you do when you do a future pace is you go to a level of consciousness that you're not yet in and you go there and you look back at, at your timeline see trying to see what was it you did to get to that place and hypnosis allows you to stay in that elevated mindset of the future thinking i already did this you know now all i have to do is find it out and do it and that's also kind of an excited state that you go back from so it's it, 
I agree with you, Freddie. It's an elegant metaphor because it it's different than just geometrics and space and physics and who am I and where am I looking and am I in it or outside it. It's an excited state of a higher being. Absolutely. So um, we are giving them an excited state and they have realized uh, in their, we could say that in their unconscious state and then when they are falling back into the ground state, which is the conscious state, what is that elevated state which uh, uh, Wolf you are telling that will be driving them to realize. So exactly. they have perceived it and uh, that is the goal and every moment knowingly or unknowingly uh, their unconscious uh, will be driving them to these situations. Somebody who is very uh, angry or maybe uh, frustrated you know, um, they will see that, you know, um, in a different perspective that, you know, this person is really associating with me and I can uh, build a friendship with that person. So instead of uh, hating and separating and alienating, he may be uh, or she may be able to bring them together. So a total new situation um, can be evolved from this elevated uh, vision which is given in the unconscious that will be driving them in every moment of their life. Yeah, I like it. So I have the, I have the quant part. I have the uh, hypnosis therapy part. And so what is your approach to the psychological part? Well, the psychological part uh, will be um, a kind of a psychoanalysis. A person will be coming, as I told you that, you know, I feel unhappy. So how will you diagnose what is the cause of this unhappiness? Then you need to interact with that person and see uh, what the probable or maybe the possible causes. So through the uh, psychoanalysis, we may be able to get uh, what is the, the present situation and uh, what the person wanted to change. And uh, we will, I will also ask them, how do you think that this is possible? Sometimes the person uh, himself or herself will be able to say that, you know, this is the, the methodology or this is the way I, but I can't. But uh, they may also give us a clue uh, what would be the possibilities. So then uh, from your own uh, rationality and from your own experience, you will be able to chalk out uh, a, a, a possible path which uh, could be aligned with that uh, particular uh, personality. And uh, during uh, the hypnosis, as you know, the, the suggestibility, that is in the hypnosis, uh, it is like super uh, conductivity. So the suggestions uh, will be going uh, directly into them and that can influence. So uh, uh, I also experienced that, you know, the, uh, the fascinating thing is that the, uh, uh, what we are saying, that is the, uh, auditory messages are converted to visual images. Yeah. So there is a person uh, with me, she has also done her doctorate. So as a postdoc with me, she is trying to understand which part and how these are connected. And uh, through uh, functional MRI and other, you know, uh, we are trying to see how, what are the changes that is happening. Yeah. So, there is uh, something which is, so the, this is my uh, psychological uh, approach. So uh, analyzing the, the problem and uh, finding a solution and through the hypnosis that is just implanted into the unconscious. Right. So, so tell me something, when, when people in India run into issues like the theme of today is crossroads in life, when life gets difficult, and that's a very subjective thing, 
For one person, a divorce could be a relief. Uh, you, maybe you don't even divorce in India. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> and for another person, you know, I mean, or if somebody dies. In, in a society like India, when somebody dies, there is a practice to surround it. In Sweden, you are invited to the funeral, you do the funeral, then you have coffee and roll torta, and then it's over. Uh, or or smorgasbricka. It, it's kind of... I, I've been to funerals in many different countries, and I... I really do think that we could improve a little bit of the after funeral communion in some way here. I'm not sure how to put this <laughs> <laughs> because I think there's a room left for, for doing that. So what happens when somebody dies in India? How do you handle that? Do people get depressed or do they meet with a family or do they cry for five days? What's the tradition? Well, um... This all depends upon the different personalities. I can say that uh, there are, uh, I think, uh, seven sisters and there was only one uh, brother. And uh, this brother was supporting the whole family. But unfortunately, what happened one day, this, uh, this only brother met with an accident and uh, he died. So the, all the sisters were so pathetic. And they don't know how to handle this such a very difficult situation. But their mother, she was more courageous. After a week, she was telling to the daughters that, you know, we have to get it over. And I think that uh, she was such a courageous person in guiding uh, the daughters and uh, there, it was the only uh, son for her. But I think it is their convictions. And I would say that it is because of uh, her spiritual upbringing. So yeah. she believes uh, in that there is something beyond life. So she told them, well, the certain time we have already cried and mourned and then, you know, the loss. Now it is time. We have to get it over. So we yeah. cannot simply uh, drag on with this. And I think that this mother, uh, yes, her youngest daughter was telling me about this because uh, she was also so depressed. And then she was telling me, and then I could uh, show her how courageous her mother, the audacious life of her mother. So through that way, I was able to give her uh, recovery. Right. So, but, so this is the thing. When, when, when a client comes to me, I don't know how it is with you, Frederick, or anybody else here who wants to ask a question as well. It's free for everybody. You write in the chat if you have questions and you want us to read them. But here, when somebody comes and they have sorrow, we, we don't have a system for dealing spiritually with sorrow. So there is even a, a working title for people who is that they are licensed sorrow therapists. And they help people handle sorrow, <laughs> which which is a little bit strange because I come, I wasn't, I didn't grow up in Sweden, so for me that's like, why would you, why would you need a special license to do that? Isn't that something natural that we should have? And and of course it's good because it's needed. But when I when clients come to me, I'll just give you an example. Uh, if they are very sad when somebody has died, it's usually because there is unfinished business. So it's usually because they didn't say goodbye properly or the person was very sick and they were, had cancer and they were in the hospital and the only image they bring up, because in NLP we talk about, you know, where, where do you keep the memory in your visual spatial craft pad? So when I say, when you think of your auntie or relative or father, what, what do you feel? And they go, I feel so bad. So I usually ask, where's the image and what image is it? And they go, it's right here and it's the last two seconds of their life. So it's no wonder they are sad all the time because every time they think of that person, the image that shows up is right here and it's the worst one. So I don't know what you do, Frederick, but, but in NLP and hypnosis, what I do is I take them into a trance and like Frederick said, you dissociate. You, you tell them, imagine you're in a movie theater and you want to show the 10 best moments of your whole lifetime with them. So you do like a photo album, you know, showing one really good memory and then another good memory and another good one at a distance. And in trance, this is easy to do. And by doing that, the next time they think of them, they see 10 nice memories instead of 
a, a dying relative close to their eyes. Have you done similar, Fredrik? Yeah, it's about the same. I do about the same way. Uh, exactly. People, uh, when they have, of course, mourning is, is natural. But when, when it goes on for too long and when it gets a problem, it's usually, uh, exactly as I said, they have a, um, a picture of the relative dying and maybe also regrets for things they didn't say or didn't do and uh, just ex exchanged, exchanged those pictures for the good ones, the good memories. Uh, exactly. Uh, that's, I don't do a movie theater, but similar. Yeah. Because the thing is here, Matthew, I, I mean, you've been to Sweden and you know this. Uh, here, when, people, when somebody says somebody died, you can't say, oh, inshallah, you know, they're up with, with, with Allah. Or you, you can't say, you know, they're with the Lord, the Lord will provide you. You can't say, oh, they've gone to see Shiva. They're having a barbecue with the half semi-gods, you know. You, you can't do that. <laughs> so Absolutely. you have to be a little bit careful and you have to go, oh, well, I'm not sure, you know, what you believe in, but some people believe that people just go away and disappear and for some they stay forever and some can communicate and you have to do this really ambiguous story because we have no idea what the person believes in and they can become really upset <laughs> if you say that people don't exist or they do exist it's a 50 50. <laughs> but I think that is the situation where you need to interact with the person and then uh, so always I think it is important to know the person so what yes. are the, their uh, uh, basic uh, attitudes, uh, whether religious, irreligious, or, you know, that will enable us uh, not to disappoint or shock the person by giving any uh, kind of, but also it was sometimes strange. Uh, during the hypnosis, uh, the, some, many people asked me that, how did you come to know that? I didn't know that, but I, I think that some situations I described it seems that uh, it was already existed in their life. I have uh, not with the, uh, deliberately, but it came. Maybe I, I would s suggest that it is a kind of uh, connectivity uh, with that person. Maybe knowing uh, uh, their uh, situations enabled me to uh, mold certain situations and uh, that came as a revelation to me as well. How did I, uh, to tell them about a kind of futuristic or uh, past uh, incidents, not exactly, but it touched, it really touched them. So, yeah. uh, so therefore uh, uh, knowing a person is also important in uh, giving them. All on a sudden you cannot just uh, give uh, therapy, but I think therefore I always take at least an hour to interact with the person, to know about the problem. So all these situations will enable me to have uh, half an hour or one hour of uh, this uh, hypnosis session. Right. So, so what, what are the, uh, if you would say, what are the top three challenges for the people you meet? Is it that somebody has died or they lost a job or they're unhappily married? What, what would be the most common crossroads? Well, I would say that there is not common. Each person has their own uh, different uh, situations. I can say that there was a lady who came uh, to me with uh, yeah, uh, some three or four uh, uh, yes, natural abortions. And that person was telling me that, you know, she cannot walk, she cannot get up. And then she was almost lost all her energy. And uh, I asked her, what is her uh, uh, religious attitude? And then um, uh, all those things. And then she told me that she had uh, the Durga, a one specific Durga. Uh, what's, maybe what's a Durga? Durga is a goddess uh, from the ah. Hindu tradition. So this uh, Durga is often sitting on uh, lioness, uh, lion and then she had a trident. <laughs> so since she was a devotee, I am a Catholic, but she told me that that is her uh, favorite goddess. So then I got an idea that, you know, so in the hypnosis, 
i uh, made in such a way that this goddess is appearing to her and uh, with that trident piercing her and her older personality of you know this weakness and everything is melted away and then she had a new uh, personality and then a new uh, transformed uh, uh, person and life situations and you know uh, she was happy after that and within a, a week she flew to the himalayas mm-hmm. and then she was walking so for me it was such a very uh, yeah strange uh, that you know one person who was saying that you know it was difficult to walk and then within a week she was able to climb the mountains yeah so this is what i said that you know a quantum leap yeah it's definitely. a metaphor but you know uh, she was able to make it by herself yeah into a higher level of her own life situation yeah i think that's a great example and i'm just explaining in swedish in the chat what's a trident uh, the, what what kind of instrument it is it's not a common word and also i find that i mean milton erickson who it was his language patterns or his hypnotic ability to communicate that was part of the modeling that became nlp so uh, uh, nlp is hypnosis is one of the three comes from three sources it's it's uh, family systems and it's uh, um gestalt therapy and it's uh, hypnosis and and this is where they started looking at modeling and then it spread to all other kinds of things so there's a lot of hypnotic techniques that people learn with nlp that are not really related they don't think it's hypnosis but it is <laughs> like anchoring and trigger points and metaphors and and reframing and and all these things but i really think it's elegant when you use metaphor and it's so much easier when there is a strong culture because when there is a culture with deities and durgas and, and tridents then you can use that i i have to use pippi longstocking for almost everybody because it's the only god we have and it's a little girl in a in a child book <laughs> but she's very powerful she's actually one of the strongest girls in the world so i have great use for her <laughs> <laughs> i think that uh, that there uh, is that you know the the uh, i mean that religion that is also in a way a metaphor that you know instead of the specific religious they also have some belief systems so whatever uh, be the belief system of the person um, the, uh, the, uh, the 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 person who is encountering that person in order to heal uh, should be able to interact and get uh, to have an idea yeah so, so that that, that uh, analysis part i think is also important uh, will enable you to heal the person more uh, uh, quickly and deeply mm. yeah definitely yeah so i i was told that there are not very many psychologists or psychotherapists in india that people go more to priests than they go to sessions is that still uh, uh, the same way or has that changed during these last years well um from the christian perspective there will be uh, more going to the the priest and then maybe from the catholic tradition we have this confession where you know it's a kind of a psychological uh, uh but <laughs> <laughs> but Uh, more uh, psychologists are there and then people started going we have uh, some celebrities uh, film actresses who were saying that you know we have depressions and then uh, professional uh, healing uh, they really uh, gone and then their own examples are enabling others and right. uh, there are also uh, yeah a number of suicides among these celebrities and then that uh, was made as a point that you need physical healing and then psychological healing yes. but for me what i believe is that you know that uh, uh, wellness is connected with the wholeness and yes. uh, this is also connected with the holiness so yes. we have uh, wholeness wellness and holiness that like means that. the the physical the psychical and the pneumatic 
So these all these together, uh, we need to heal. So a person is not merely a body. A person is also endowed with the the psychological or the the mind, but that person is also a spiritual. So maybe the the problems are related to the the physical. It can be for the psychological or it can also be the spiritual. This also I have found. Yeah. This is what I said that, you know, a, a Swedish person who came to me and then, you know, her problem of meaninglessness was because of the, the spiritual. Yeah. Like I said, the burnout of, of lack of existential. Yeah. Yes. Anchoring. So, yeah. So therefore we, this is what I consider that. Uh, and in my place, I can show you uh, maybe some photos of that, uh, that I have three circles and this, uh, so it is three, really three ponds. And then um, uh, from uh, the physical uh, pond that is uh, um, uh, four feet deep, and then the psychical is uh, five feet and the uh, pneumatic is six feet. So the water flows from the four, uh, that is the physical to the uh, psychical and from there to the spiritual. So therefore it is all inextricably intertwined. <laughs> and so also at the, at the end of it all, it's all in the soul. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it could be, but I think these three are very important. Yes, but unfortunately are. In, our, in, our, in our culture, Simply the physical exercises, uh, mm. and then you know, Absolutely. merely the body dimension mm -hmm. is becoming more and more. But the other dimensions are also very important for healing. So I, I have a question for you. Uh, I'm not sure if we discussed this previously, but the way I've understood it, I mean, you are a Catholic priest in India, correct? From yes. the Carmelites, and yes. Hinduism is a prevailing. But is Hinduism something you can have at the same time, because I'm, I'm told Hinduism is regards itself not exactly as a religion, but something you can believe in while you believe in other things. Is that correct? Um, yes. Uh, um, see, the, there is also the, the philosophical uh, uh, religion as well as uh, the, uh, the practicing religion. The practicing religion, there are thousands and thousands of gods and goddesses. But uh, if you read into the uh, Upanishads, uh, this is uh, known as um, uh, Samskara or Sanatana Dharma. So this Sanatana Dharma is the value system. So this is uh, what you may find it in the uh, Upanishads. That means, you know, the, the most reflective. But unfortunately, uh, the, the present uh, generation is more highlighting only uh, the externals and the, the images and other things. But Hinduism has the depth of it. That is why it is known as the Sanadana Dharma. That means the value system, uh, the eternal value system. And I think that the eternal value system for every other religious tradition is the same. I also, not only with the, uh, with the Hindus, but I also teach the Buddhist monks. Yeah. What I teach the Buddhist monks uh, is uh, physics. And uh, His Holiness Dalai Lama himself uh, told me that I should go and teach them. That is the reason why I went. And I learned from them meditation. Yes. So it is a kind of a barter system. And then I uh, developed again another meditative process uh, using yoga, then uh, this Buddhist uh, meditation, then uh, also from the Orthodox uh, tradition that the Jesus prayer. And then for me as a Catholic, you know, Jesus Christ as the Sanatana Sadguru. Yes. So it is, what is the, the guru is a, an embodiment of a value system. But the whole guru system, could you explain that? Because I, I've understood that uh, young people, sometimes in elevated families of, of good economy, they will go see a guru for a longer time as to help them 
to understand how to handle their spiritual relationship with themselves and life. Is that correct? Or how is that system today? Uh, see, uh, <laughs> to tell you uh, that, you know, India markets gurus. Yes. We have uh, plenty of gurus who are coming to the <laughs> West and then uh, would say that, you know, from the, the time of um, uh, the, uh, yeah, the, the first, the music group, I forgot their uh, name. Uh, so th there was Maharshi Mahesh Yogi and then, you know, so all these uh, people, but if you, uh, in the Hindu tradition, instead of uh, listening, they will say that, you know, they just want to uh, see a guru. Guru, what is the real meaning is that the one who is removing the ignorance or uh, the darkness, bringing them to the light. Guru. Right. So, the, so, so like that is the, the meaning. A person who is, but uh, fortunately or unfortunately, we have plenty of them. And then they are all coming to the West and then they are marketing themselves, getting money, establishes huge empires. So this is actually happening. And uh, uh, the, the real meaning uh, you can find uh, in, in the Buddhist tradition. This right. Is... So, so basically you could say that coaching is a guru tradition. Absolutely. Coaching uh, is a way of grooming a person how to uh, handle uh, the situations. Who is yeah. a guru? I can give you an example uh, with a Buddhist uh, story. So in a village, there was a Buddhist monk and then uh, the, the people were all uh, coming to that person. Uh, and then uh, there was a young woman there and then she happened to be pregnant. And then uh, people asked her, who is the, the father of your uh, baby? And then she said that this is the, the guru. And then all those people went to him and then they criticized him how nasty uh, you are. We never thought that you are a spiritual person, but it seems that, you know, you made crash our belief systems and all, you know, so you are. Then he asked them, what shall I do? Then uh, they told him, you take care of this uh, woman. So then she, he accepted, that Buddhist monk accepted her and then she delivered the baby and then almost an year, uh, this Buddhist monk was taking care of her and then she had the guilt feeling. And then after an year, uh, she revealed to the others that this is not the, 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 her, the father of the child is not the Buddhist monk, but someone else. Then all these people were coming and prostrating before him and uh, asked the forgiveness. Then uh, he asked them, what shall we do now? Then the, they said that uh, forgive us and then they, they have taken the woman and then uh, sent her away. Uh, so this is what uh, Stida Pratnya. In time of criticism, in time of praise, this Buddhist monk is straight or uh, I can say that, you know, he is uh, neither uh, frustrated or angry or, uh, but he was keeping uh, his uh, consciousness steady. Yeah. So that is actually a, a guru, a person who is very stable in his life never influenced by any anything of this materiality or but having a value system when it comes to the value system matthew in nlp uh, nlp is i mean it's it's not religious or spiritual it's an observation of the process of thought and thought structure and language structure how we process our experience on earth but there are some core values or uh, in nlp and it is said that in lack of a spiritual uh, movement, if you follow them, you will actually follow most religious core principles. So I just want to take an example and hear your take on it because one, one in NLP, which is very normal is that all human actions 
have an intention, a positive intention in some way, and that reality has many maps or every person has their own map or your map is not the reality. And if you look at the Hindu principles, you have Bhagavad Gita, which says that all human beings are driven by perception, which is their senses. And you also have the one is from the, the guna, uh, that the personality is determined by his or her guna and karma, that the own nature and past actions determine the present personality of every individual. So this, this for me is like saying the same thing, you know, from, from two places. And like you said, the Hindu principles are among the oldest on the earth. So most other principles are probably have taken a little sneak look at them. When, when I and Frederick were, were writing about uh, divinity and soul in a book project we've been doing for four years now, we, we landed on the Hindu principles and they seemed to be the ones that if we took away every mention of Hinduism, we would have a set of rules that anybody could live by. Well, I think uh, in Hinduism, there are lots of positive aspects, as you said. But uh, there is something which says that the karma, the karma makes you not to transform. You are, uh, so the fate is there and then you are condemned to repeat. So that is uh, there, uh, uh, I think uh, uh, I couldn't accept that one. Because no. you know, you are a person who is capable of changing it. Yeah. But karma is there that, you know, it is like uh, the uh, third law of Newton, that is uh, every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. So therefore this action will definitely have a reaction and then you have to undergo that one but yeah. that is the past life so uh, you are capable of changing it mm. and if you don't uh, believe that there is a possibility of changing you are condemned simply to crawl you have to follow and there and you, you go and now, and now you're back at the Christianity because Jesus said that your faith will set you free. So if you believe you are not condemned, you are not condemned anymore. Yes, you, you are free, <laughs> absolutely. Whether Jesus or uh, anybody, but I would say that, you know, that is the basic foundation. You are totally free. Yeah. And you are not uh, determined by the fate. No. Not the past, but your actions is capable of transforming you. So that's one more question there, because I think we can open up because people may have questions and answers here a little bit. But one of the points that Frederick and I stopped on in, in the Hindu principles that we found, we don't know if these are the correct, if there are many versions of Hindu principles, but one was do all the work in the spirit of yagnya. Yag, yagnya. <laughs> yagnya, yagnya means sacrifice. Yagnya. yagnya. Yeah, so it's the explanation that we found was that mankind can progress as, as a flock, as mankind, as a, as a being. We can only progress through striving together. So we should look for teamwork in all human endeavors. Is that the idea? Yeah, Yetnya, um, yeah, I think uh, you have given a new interpretation to it. Okay. Well, if I, if I uh, say that, you know, the, the, what is the sacrifice? Initially, the sacrifice in the Vedic rituals, it is either to get uh, more cows or uh, your uh, forefathers should get heaven. And uh, 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 these were the, the, the ideals of uh, Yetnya. Uh, but the way you have interpreted, I think uh, it is uh, very, uh, uh, very, very uh, differently. Uh, that is the... Um, I think maybe influenced by the modern uh, way of, you know, this uh, networking. Yeah. So this is very, 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 very important. And uh, in my neighborhood, you know, in my campus, there is a tree. I don't know exactly what is the name of it. I have seen that, you know, roots normally they separate and then they go always separate. But in this tree, the roots I found that, you know, separated, coming together, separate coming together and that is such a fascinating i can send you the photo maybe tomorrow 
I can send mm -hmm. you, you can share it to, to the others. So it is so fascinating. So I think uh, this is exactly what uh, we need to do networking. Yeah. Connectivity, association. That is the way the human uh, race have progressed, building upon. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, on what we have already developed. And uh, that is why, yeah, from uh, classical physics, quantum mechanics, relativity. So, you know, you, you, the, the, we are going up. So, so I have a deep question for you now, and I'm asking you to reach into your Catholic belief system, into your Hindu belief system, into your human and professor and quantum belief system. Okay? So I'm, go I'm going to say something that might upset some people, but it's not intended to, because I really mean this profoundly. I believe that for the first time in modern age, thanks to Corona, we are all facing the fact that as humans, we share the same earth and we are dependent on each other. And there is an invisible enemy, if we want to call it that, uh, that reminds us that it doesn't matter if we're rich or poor, we still have to wash our hands, all of us, and we still have to be careful. So in a way, the philosophical side of me, taking aside the pain of everybody who has lost somebody in this, because I too have lost friends in this, but there is a humbling factor in being faced as humanity with all our technology and shining objects and and weapons and airplanes and computers and high heels and translating arms and all of this <laughs> and plastic bags, lots of them. But at the same time, we are being humbled back into who we are and what it is all about. I would just like to hear, you know, your take on that. Absolutely. I agree with uh, you. And uh, I would say that there is again uh, another metaphor. So this is a joke I have seen um, as a kind of a cartoon or, or, or pictures three gorillas are sitting laughing at the humans. Yeah. You know, what was the, you might have seen it. No. It was uh, that, uh, yes, the, the description there, you know, why they were laughing. Because in the uh, 20th century, uh, humans declared that they will be walking on Mars. But unfortunately, these uh, uh, gorillas were joking and laughing loudly that, you know, they cannot step out of their rooms. <laughs> so, and I, I, I found it so fascinating, the claims <laughs> of science, technology. We were saying that, you know, we have conquered everything uh, yeah. because of the power of the science and technology. It, it has uh, these small, uh, uh, these uh, nano virus has shown us that, you know, as you said, uh, Wolf, that, you know, the humbling experience. We are nothing. We are just a speck in this vast universe. And even a small virus can stop us, defeat us. And uh, we are uh, dumbfounded in front of that. We can't do. So whatever be our technology, whatever uh, be our claims, the overarching claims of uh, modernity, uh, rationality. So that has been collapsed. Exactly. So, so we, have is... to, we have to find something else now. We have to move back into spirituality and networking and real meaning. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I think that uh, there is something beyond our own power and control. Even a small virus can change us. Absolutely, there will be other uh, forces which will be much uh, higher, either to save us or uh, maybe to, uh, to, to destroy us. You see that the havoc, how much uh, this small virus has created in the whole uh, universe, you know. And also it showed us that, you know, we were so speed, haste, busy, <laughs> but simply we are scratching and sitting in the the, the the rooms, you know, we can't do anything else. You cannot go and meet people <laughs> and then, uh, you know, and then uh, cover and then maybe, uh, yes, now we are in a wider distance place. You know, even the, the face mask, <laughs> that will become uh, a, a continuous uh, process. And then people will think that, you know, our face itself is a private part. 
Yeah, and, and we, which means that not saying hello with your hand, you know, maybe just saying hello like this and covering your body. Okay. Uh, sounds like some religions from very long time ago. <laughs> they were doing it. So I would say that as you said, you know, it was a humbling experience for us. Yeah. Showed us who we are. Yeah. We are not masters, but we are existing Cupid. with everyone else the the uh, the world or the earth belongs to everyone it is not reserved for human beings no and the animal life that we haven't cared so much about we've only exploited it they're doing pretty good there are not many dolphins with a face mask they're still swimming in the ocean having fun so yes i can say that you know recently in my place we have a uh, uh, sheep goats cows, dogs, chicken. And then I found that, you know, how fascinating it to, uh, to relate to them. Yeah. And we have named them, calling them, they are running to us and then, you know, feeding them. It is such a very fascinating to, there is a beautiful uh, message given by um, uh, Marcel, Gabriel Marcel who was a existential philosopher. To exist is to coexist. And exactly. to coexist is to pro-exist. And to exist is to live with others and to live for others. And this has been uh, highly enhanced by Levinas, Emmanuel Levinas, our responsibility for the other. Definitely, definitely. So we are getting close. We're 1911 here and the Swedes, we are, you know, we're not like in India that precise with the clock. We're a little bit more like maybe 30 seconds back and forth. So if somebody has a Q&A here, if anybody has a question, a thought, a reflection, please, you know, this is a unique opportunity to bounce it on a person who has traveled the world, known the physics and the spirituality. So throw your best one at Matthew. Most welcome. Yes, Yanni. We can't hear you. But we want to. Yes, Jenny, please. I can't, uh, we can't hear you. About now? Yes. yes. Perfect. Perfect. Uh, I was just thinking since, since we had the topic crisis today, uh, there are some parts that sort of comes very clear for me, both with myself, my, with clients and from this discussion, that we all need to have some belief in something higher than ourselves. We need to have a, a community or something to belong to, and we need to have the ability to ask for help when we can't sort ourselves out. So uh, pretty much, the, I think most of us with the knowledge have, have all the tools with NLP and hypnosis and stuff. Uh, and still when you're there in the moment, you can't sort it out yourself because you can't. So uh, it's important parts, especially with this, uh, with the Corona going around that we are sort of separated from each other that we, when we need each other even more. So it's interesting. I think that's a very good summary. I mean, what, what, good is, what good is the ladder that somebody needs to hold for you? If nobody holds it, the ladder is useless. Yeah, yeah thanks for that. Beautiful. A anybody else wants to interact? I told Matthew you would all ask a lot of questions. <laughs> yes, <laughs> they have all understood <laughs> uh, or, or, you know, they know much more than what I said, so... Yeah, I always liked uh, uh, Sweden, Stockholm, and then uh, also the the villages. I stayed somewhere there, so it is fantastic. I was expected to come uh, this year, but by June. But I think all COVID changed, and then don't know when we will be able to meet again. But I think this is a very fascinating. Uh, discussion. All of you are into uh, hypnosis or uh, networking uh, of uh, NLP experts? Well, I think most people here come from very different places. Some people are working 
uh, with it as a part-time tool. Some people have it as a main tool. Uh, most everybody here is, comes from an NLP perspective and a lot have added hypnosis. We can ask with the hands up. So how many here uh, are NLP using NLP actively and consciously because you've trained it and you're using it? There you go. And how many here are using hypnosis actively because, or as a part of what you're doing because you know it and have learned it? There you go. Yeah, so it's, it's, a, it's a mixture. Yes. And there was a question from Monica. Yes, uh, I have a question since you uh, are Christian. Uh, me too. Uh, what is your view on the connection of forgiveness, Holy Spirit, transformation and the release of karma well i think uh, uh, karma if you are believing in it uh, it will be forcefully upon us which will be blocking uh, our ability to transform mm. that would uh, i think uh, will be my take on karma, there are others who may have different uh, things. Then uh, about forgiveness, uh, I can say that um, that is also a very important value that will enable us uh, to transcend our own limitations, to show our own uh, strength because if you are capable of forgiving, that will uh, give us more power. Yeah. And if we are not forgiving, I think even uh, our own physical body uh, will be punishing us to in some ways that you know that uh, the uh, it is a great release. So you are in control of yourself if you are capable of forgiving. I can give you an example. Uh, His Holiness Dalai Lama uh, told uh, me uh, that if he is thinking negatively about the Chinese, that you know they have taken away the land, the power, and uh, and everything, then uh, he would say that uh, that is sinful. He would uh, say that you know uh, that is not correct then he will feel remorse about that. So that means uh, even to an opponent, even to a person who has given you uh, very negative things, you should not uh, curse them or, you know, at least, at least you should be able to, this is, I think a great principle, but very difficult to practice. I can say it from my own life, but uh, I think uh, forgiveness is something very, noble uh, virtue but uh, it is extremely difficult but it will be a great release yeah. it's like prayer for your your enemies jesus said yes absolutely yeah. and i'm I... thinking about, yeah, sorry. in a way forgiveness helps you to transform i think this montutu has also worked together with uh holiness uh, lama uh, uh, but I'm thinking about the transformation forgiveness. Um, in your work, do you work with the con uh, forgiveness to transform? Um, yes. Um, I told you about, uh, you know, um, yeah, yeah, a friend of mine, Swedish, uh, she felt meaninglessness because mm. somebody who had abused her in her early childhood. Mm. So ultimately, uh, she was capable of uh, transcending uh, that uh, difficulty was that forgiving that person. Mm. So that forgiveness gave her a great release and uh, that lifted her up, which I said earlier, you know, a kind of leap into the higher uh, levels. Yeah. Thank Could you. I just... Could I ask something to that while you're here also, Monica? Because mm -hmm. in the book, Conversations with Richard Bandler, which is mm -hmm. one of the founders of NLP, there is a chapter where he talks about forgiveness. And I read it a lot of times because 
I have a lot of clients which have, have, have been abused. They have been raped, they have been abused, they are mentally or physically or emotionally. And sometimes the person who did it has left the earth. So there's no way, <laughs> there's no way to, to get a closure. So they ask me, should I forgive them? And my take on this, I, I'm saying this because you sparked it, Monica, with what you said. And I'm happy to hear what you think. This is my personal view because it works in therapy. I tell people that forgiveness is not something you give other people because what they did was wrong and it can never be made right. It's something you give yourself to allow yourself to move on. Hmm. You, you give yourself forgiveness for what they did. Hmm. So that if they, and this is according to Bandler now, that if they show remorse and change their behavior and show that they want to change, then you might allow them to walk along your path again. And you have forgiven your remorse for them. And that's also what Nelson Mandela did when he went out of prison after 27 years. He said, I am not carrying this bitter fruit anymore. They took 27 years. They are not taking another second. Hmm. So in school, we tell children, tell them you're sorry, you know, and, and that's like asking for forgiveness. But really, we're just asking for people to move on and change their conduct so they don't do it again. Mm -hmm. now, that's interesting. I work in school and uh, I uh -huh. usually handle conflicts and uh, uh, I don't feel congruent with the way we are supposed to work. <laughs> no, <laughs> so thank it, you. It's really bad. You should not excuse something that was bad. And you should not say you're sorry if you're not. <laughs> no. Yeah, it's interesting. So it's asking the person, can you move on? <laughs> no, it's asking yourself. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. These people hurt me. Do I allow myself to move on? Will I let go of my vengeance, my misery, my sadness, my hunger for uh, you know redemption? And will I allow myself to move on, being in a higher state where I will not allow this to be something that keeps ruining my life. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you for a great question. That was really, really good. So does anybody else have something to say? Because if not, we might round this off because we will need standing ovations for at least nine minutes for Matthew. So. <laughs> 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 one, one thing to say. Yes. Yeah. Hi, Matthew. Uh, thank you very much for your thoughts. Uh, and uh, yeah, it was very in interesting taking part of your thoughts today. And for me, the, the uh, my quantum leap, this uh, webinar, I think, is. Um, that we that we're telling different stories about the same uh, things, according to our religion, our culture, our history, and, and so on. And for me, it was so obvious when you spoke about all these things from your perspective. It um, it was, yeah, it really changed my 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 perspectives on on things. So I don't really know what was new, except a feeling of change. Thank you. Uh, uh, my... so, I, so I just want to thank you for that. Thank you for mm. being here. Great Thanks. for mm. that positive uh, comments. And I think we were uh, sharing uh, because uh, everybody uh, knows and then we are in a world where you know the knowledge is available. So the processing uh, might be uh, differently. So uh, anything uh, which I have may not be given absolutely new, but uh, maybe uh, with different shades. I think that will help you to look from a different perspective. Yeah, and that might be just what well, uh, what's needed to do a quantum leap. <laughs> yes. I, I, I had a client yesterday that um, has this childhood trauma from, from the first year of his life. And uh, it was his mother that, that uh, was the abuser. Uh, and I asked him, how old was your mother? 
24, 25, okay. And how old are you now? 64. Okay. <laughs> and um, that, that insight was uh, more or less like a quantum leap for him. When he all of a sudden could, could see it from another perspective. And of course, I let him walk into that room and take care of himself and and um, and forgive his his mother just or just move on like Ulf said just moving on from from the situation you don't need it anymore so sometimes it, you just need another perspective to to make this quantum leap and that's that's really in, interesting thank in you in praise of the in praise of little things <laughs> And that's cool because that's basically what NLP reframing does. NLP reframing allows you to take a quantum leap into another frame of mind by looking at it as a different way. And hypnosis allows you to do that because it, you can put your critical faculty on the side that is stopping you, you know, from reaching this elevated level because you know, you think you know that it's impossible. So that's, that's very cool. Cool tools. Well, I think if you want to write your regards to Matthew, you can just shower him with love and affection in the chat, or you can unmic yourself and say something. But he will be in Sweden one day as soon as the virus stops and the planes start flying and and the and the and the gods allow it. Matthew, this might be completely off the cuff, and maybe it's not even appropriate, but how do you handle, on one hand, having a monoidism with Catholicism, and on the other hand, a polyidism with Hinduism? Well, uh, this is uh, what we have misunderstood Hinduism. Uh, see, in the inner core, uh, it is also having these monotheistic uh, tendencies. It is. So, um, so it's all one uh, God, but it's the same God expressed in a lot of different. Ah, uh, yes, God. in myriad forms. Right. So you would say it's like in it, like this. Ah, it is like you know <laughs> a set uh, uh, in mathematical uh, subset or a, yeah. a big set yeah. and then plenty of other. So you, could, so you could say, and that's the philosophical side of Hinduism, which I like a lot, which is that you could regard any of the semi-gods as a metaphor for a part of yourself. And the way they solve their, their situation could be something you could be inspired by to solve your situation in life. Yes, but uh, our interpretations may not be able to be uh, universalized. Because here in the present situation, you know, they are asserting in their own particular frames. Right. So therefore, uh, yeah, we, we can claim it as metaphor, but they will uh, claim uh, it as in a different way. Which they have a right to do. Thank you, Matthew. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yes, Ulf and uh, Frederick and uh, all of you for the wonderful questions. Yes, Jenny, Matt, Monica, and uh, everyone. And I hope that one day uh, I could meet you, uh, maybe in Stockholm or elsewhere. Definitely Stockholm, Sweden, is a very uh, splendid place. Um, yeah, I am expected in 2022, uh, uh, June, I think there was a conference. Uh, this conference is postponed to uh, the 2022 June. So if possible, I will be there then maybe, or even before, or you are also most welcome to India, the place where I am. Um, it is uh, Bangalore, there are connectivity, and then, you know, yeah, I can introduce to you this different religious, spiritual uh, wealth. So maybe if uh, both of you, Frederick and uh, Ulf, want to lead a team, we can go around when things are uh, more possible. Otherwise, uh, as you have seen here, you know, the global screen. We are connected because of the pandemic. Came the whole globe together. Exactly. And I think that, that is the possibility. Though, so this challenge is an opportunity for us to come together. And thank you very much for inviting me. 
to this uh, great uh, session of interactions and connectivity networking. And anybody, everybody who wants to join and buy Matthew a great lunch when he comes to Sweden, raise your hand and we'll see. <laughs> Class reunion of 2021 or 22. Let's all just do it. Yes. All right, great. Matthew. Don't worry about lunch. It will be fine. <laughs> <laughs> Here it is. Uh, yes. Um, midnight. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for staying up late for us as well. We really appreciate it. We know it's no, no, it was fascinating time. and a great awakening for me. <laughs> for us too well from awakening to sleep thank you Matthew <laughs> okay bye bye Wolf and Frederick and bye. all of you good Stay night good. bye 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 everybody take care bye